sing to me. The Odyssey, an original adaptation written and retold for you by John Buckeridge. Chapter 6 The Cyclops The white bleach skull flew high, high into the air, tumbling over and over. It arced perfectly and then fell down, down, until crash! It smashed into smithereens as it hit the floor. That was a good one, yelled the weasel-faced suitor who'd thrown it. And all around the great hall in Ithaca, the men cheered with delight. The suitor ran to grab another skull as the houseboy crept under the tables to clear up the mess. The skull was a pig's skull, and given the number of pigs the suitors were eating every day, there were plenty in supply. The suitors were playing a game they'd invented called skull busting. It wasn't very complicated. The aim is to take the skull from the pig they'd eaten and see how high they had to throw it to make it smash into really small pieces. It wasn't complicated, but then neither were the suitors. At least most of them weren't. Sitting apart from the skull busting crowd, a duo had their heads together in quiet conversation. And you're sure he's left the island? He could just be on the far side visiting his grandfather. This was Antinous. The suitors didn't have a leader, not officially, but that's only because Antinous had never told them they had. I'm telling you he's gone, replied a tall, weak-chinned suitor named Eurymachus. One of the slaves reported it to me personally. Eurymachus wasn't Antinous's right-hand man, not officially, but only because Antinous had never told him he was. Good, replied Antinous. Finally, we're rid of the little snot. Antinous was tall, chiseled, charming, and handsome, in many ways exactly the kind of man you'd want to take home to Grandma. Except his eyes. He had cold, dead eyes like a shark, and he looked at everyone like they were his next meal. What do you mean? Eurymachus asked, wheedling. He always loved it when Antinous included them in his plans. It made him feel so important. I mean, I'm sick of that little princeling moping around here, talking about his father and reminding Penelope all about him, said Antinous flatly. He's decided to take a little voyage, has he? Well, I hope he never comes back. Another pig skull smashed behind them, and Antinous scowled over his shoulder. The longer mummy dearest Penelope is apart from her precious son, the longer we have to plant seeds in her mind and make her give up hope of Odysseus's return, and then she'll be forced to make her choice. He said it all with icy calm. It was careful and methodical and efficient. Grinning, Eurymachus nodded and they continued to make their plans. Looking down on them from up on her balcony, Penelope felt a pit of fear in her stomach. She didn't know what those two men were discussing, but she knew it wasn't good. Refusing to let that fear show on her face, she prayed silently to the gods and thought, Odysseus, if you're out there, get back home. Far across the ocean, Odysseus was standing in a different hall, surrounded by half the kingdom of Phaeacia as they listened to his story. He had told them of his disastrous attack on Ismarus and their haunting visit to the land of the Lotus Eaters, where men forgot everything but the fateful fruit, and the Phaeacians were enthralled. Merciful Zeus, exclaimed King Alcinous, that Lotus Island sounds like a monstrous place. But where did you go next? Oh, said Odysseus, our journeys to monstrous places were only just beginning, he told the man, and Odysseus closed his eyes and remembered as a tear ran down his cheek. When they had left the land of the Lotus Eaters, Odysseus and the Ithacan fleet were sure the worst must be behind them. As Dawn's rosy fingers danced across the waves, Eurylochus let out a cry, Land ho! On their starboard side was a cluster of islands. Odysseus gave the orders, and the Ithacan fleet pulled onto the nearest shore. Remembering his oath to Athena, Odysseus sent men out to scout where they'd landed. The island's deserted, reported Perimedes when they came back together. But the neighbouring one looks like it might have life. There's plenty of sheep out there, huge great beasts. Right, said Odysseus. You men stay here and me and my crew will go and take ships to check it out. If we're not back in three days, you get out of here. That is an order. 
and so Odysseus and his crew sailed across to the island. When they arrived, they saw Perimides was right. The sheep there were huge. I told you, sir, said Perimides. You could ride that one like a horse. Yes, Perimides, replied Odysseus, but I wouldn't recommend it. They continued on, and eventually they came to a cave. Nosing their way inside, they found it absolutely filled with fleeces, mutton, sheep hides, and huge wheels of cheese the height of a man. Look at these, sir, said Perimides. One of these could feed the whole crew all the way back to Ithaca. Why don't we just take a few and scarper? Perimides, did we not learn our lesson about taking things that don't belong to us when we attacked Ismarus? And Odysseus remembered the eighty men they had lost in that stupid, pointless skirmish. No. Let's wait here until whoever owns this cave comes back and then we'll see if they'll trade some cheese for this wine I brought. So they sat patiently until as evening fell they heard sheep bleating. It got louder and louder and was abruptly accompanied by the drumming of a thousand hooves as hundreds of the huge white sheep came rushing into the cavern. Odysseus and his men darted to the back to keep from being trampled and suddenly the cave went dark. Odysseus peered out to see what had blocked out the light. There was a chipping sound, then a flash and a breath as a flame was kindled, and in that flickering illumination, Odysseus saw precisely what was blocking out the light. A huge giant of a man stood in the mouth of the cave. He was as tall as a ship was long, and his shoulders were broad and muscular. As the giant turned his head to scan the cave, Odysseus saw that instead of two eyes on his face, He had one great eye that roamed around counting his sheep. A cyclops. Let's get out of here, Odysseus whispered to his men. But before they could move, the cyclops nodded his head, reached out of the cave and hauled a vast rock over the entrance. They were trapped. Huddling in fear, the Ithacans watched as the cyclops set about tending his sheep, humming a gentle song, and Odysseus suddenly thought he might have misjudged the creature. After all, it couldn't choose how it was made, could it? And big and monstrous didn't necessarily mean it was a big monster. Stepping forward, he cleared his throat to address the Cyclops. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hello. I'm terribly sorry to bother you, but my name is... He didn't get to finish, because the Cyclops turned his head, saw the Ithacans, and an evil glint came into his solitary eye. Sneaking forward a massive hand, he lunged forward. Odysseus threw himself out of the way, but some of his men weren't quite so lucky. The Cyclops grabbed three of them and, without a word, bit their heads clean off. He chewed thoughtfully and swallowed. I do so like it, the beast rumbled, when guests bring dinner. He went on chewing with a wide grin as blood ran down his chin. For a moment, Odysseus was too shocked even to think. Reaching down, he grabbed hold of his sword and was about to charge forward and stab the beast to death when a little voice in his head asked him, And then what? Odysseus paused. He looked at the huge rock over the mouth of the cave and knew only one creature in there had the strength to move it and it wasn't going to be him. No, the Cyclops had to live if they wanted to get out of there. His mind flashed back to Troy, where he'd looked around the Greek camp and got the idea for the huge wooden horse. And looking round the cave, he made his plans and stepped forward once again. Sorry about that. That was our fault, really, coming in unannounced. My name's Badi. Nah, Badi. I can see that eating my crew members has given you quite a thirst. Would you like some wine to wash it down? He held up the wineskin he'd brought to trade. It was tiny in the Cyclops' massive hands as he drained the whole thing in a single gulp. Got you, thought Odysseus, because that wasn't just any wine. It was a special extra strength brew. A single gulp of that would have you flat on your back in ten minutes if you didn't water it down, and a whole wineskin was enough for a hundred men to share. Sure enough, soon the Cyclops started to look a bit giddy. He sat down on the ground, slumped his head to one side, and fell into a deep, snoring slumber. Now, men, whispered Odysseus as he pulled them into a huddle, I've got a plan. Lifting together, the Ithacans grabbed a huge walking stick that was propped by the door, and using their swords, they cut one end into a point. They shoved the point into the fire to make it hard, and as they pulled it out, it smoked softly with the heat. 
Then they lined up along its length, balancing it across their shoulders like a battering ram. Charge! yelled Odysseus, and they ran forward, thrusting the red-hot spike deep into the Cyclops's single sleeping eye. There was a hissing sound and the smell of burnt meat. The Cyclops woke up, letting out a terrible, earth-shaking yell. The sheep squealed in fear, and Odysseus and his men cowered into the corners of the cave. It let out another wailing cry and heaved the spike from its eye. Suddenly, from outside the cave, they heard voices calling, but these weren't human voices. They were great booming voices, like the Cyclops himself. Polyphemus? yelled a great voice. Are you all right? What's all the yelling for? Has someone hurt you? Inside the cave, Polyphemus let out another howling wail and cried, Nobody has hurt me! Nobody has hurt me! Well, if nobody has hurt you, came the voice of his neighbors from outside, then stop your yelling! And the Ithacans heard the sound of rocks sliding over cave mouths in the distance. All that night, the Cyclops mewled and whined to himself. But as morning came, his sheep began to bleat once more. Sheep are not famed for their intelligence, but they know what they want, and right now these sheep wanted grass, and that meant being outside. They called and barred and bleated until eventually Polyphemus took notice. Feeling his way forward, he grabbed hold of the rock across the cave mouth and shoved it aside. Then he sat across the cave entrance, with his hand barring the way, stroking each sheep as they went by to make sure no Ithacans escaped. Quickly, hissed Odysseus. Grab hold of a sheep and hold on to it underneath. Cling on for dear life. And they did. One by one, the Ithacans were carried past the guarding Cyclops by his sheep, rescued by an unknowing saviour. As soon as they were out of the cave, they jumped up and ran for their ship as fast as their legs would carry them. Hurry! yelled Odysseus as they clambered on board. Let's get out of here! And the Ithacans pushed their boat from the shore. As they cut across the surf, Odysseus was filled with relief for their escape and regret for his lost men. The swirling mix of emotions boiled up inside him, and a scream of outrage tore free from his lips. Turning back to the island, he yelled across the water to the Cyclops, We've escaped you, Cyclops, and you'll never see us again. In fact, you'll never see anything again. And the next time your neighbours ask you who hurt you, you tell them it was Odysseus, King of Ithaca, Sacker of Cities. He threw his head back and howled his defiance at the monster as the Ithacans completed their escape to rejoin the rest of their fleet. In the great hall at Phaeacia, Odysseus hung his head far from the crowing hero he had been on that boat what seemed like a lifetime ago. I didn't know it then, he told the spellbound room. But I had just made one of the most powerful enemies a man can make and signed the death warrant for most of my crew. <laughs>